Oh. You say go team? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give everybody a moment to log in. All right, welcome everyone to preview week for Willamette, the Pinot Noir auction. The wines featured in this tasting series are small lot bottlings for our exclusive trade auction. You can contact Emily at the WVWA and I'll drop her email address in the chat if you don't know about the auction and you'd like to learn more. For this year's auction, we're pleased to announce a charitable partnership with the James Beard Foundation's Food and Beverage Investment Fund for Black and Indigenous Americans as a part of their Open for Good campaign. All funds on auction lots raised beyond the opening bids as well as through the Paddle Raise Pledge, will go to the investment fund. And I'll drop their website in the chat as well. I also want to take a moment to thank all auction sponsors for their ongoing support. And now I'd like to introduce today's featured panelists, representing lot number 45, Robert Britton of Britton Vineyards, representing, lot, representing lot 48, Ian Birch of Archery Summit, representing lot 49, Megan Vandette of Dusky Goose, representing lot 50, Anne Sari of Highland Estate, and representing lot 51, Megan Weil of Rain Dance Vineyards. And now I'd like to kick it off to our host, Allison Sokoblosser of Sokoblosser Winery. Allison, they're all yours. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you all are. We're so excited that you're joining us and joining us for this new format. So 2020 is definitely the year of a lot of firsts. Um, I know for me, it's like the first time I've worried about running out of toilet paper, and it's also the first time that I've cut my kids' hair, and they've even cut their own hair, and it's also, <laughs> most importantly, the first time that we're doing this Willamette Pinot auction online. So what it means to do it online is that it means that we get to do these very cool online seminars and bring the Willamette Valley to you, because we miss you. We know you can't come see us but um, hopefully this is the next best thing to replace you actually being here in person and tasting these lines and chatting with us and hearing our stories firsthand is to do it online with you all. So it's kind of odd for us because we're so used to doing this face to face with everybody and we can't see you all. So we'd love to know who's out there, who's watching, who's paying attention. Please let us know um, where, you're, where you're watching us from. We'd love to, love to know where you're all from. And so um, what we're going to do is we're going to start off and each of the winemakers is going to get to give some quick intros of themselves and their wineries. Um, then we're going to talk about our amazing auction lots and the 2018 vintage. Uh, we're going to talk about the influence of soils um, and the influence of the winemaker's hand um, in crafting the wines. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. So please um, ask questions along the way and we will incorporate them into um, our presentation or we'll get to them at the end. So again, thanks so much for being here. And with that, let's get started. So um, Robert, since you're number 45, we're gonna start off with you. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and, and Britain Vineyards. Well, thanks Allison. And thank you for all everybody who's tuned in here and, and uh, joining us for this little event. Uh, this is kind of fun. It's also, as Allison said, it's very awkward because I'm so used to talking to people who I can see and respond to. So please, I know that there is a provision for asking questions. Um, all of us really certainly would love it if you would ask some questions and make this as interactive as we can. I'll tell you a little bit about Britain Vineyards. So Britain Vineyards was uh, established uh, in, the vineyard was planted in 2001. My wife Ellen and I bought this property in 2004 and we did it as sort of an, the, the next phase of an extension of, at that time, about 30 years of winemaking on my part. I just became completely obsessed with this idea of unique wines, wines that are the way they are, not because of all the things that you can do as a winemaker, but because of a site. And so the vineyard is an estate property, uh, meaning that the grapes are grown and made by me from, from this one piece of property. Um, and it is comprised of a series of, of microsites that are unique because of the geology and the topography. You know, one of the really great things about 
the Willamette Valley is, is that it is an incredibly diverse um, subculture, as it were, of geology, topography. I mean, it just has all these amazing opportunities to make very expressive Pinot Noir. And my obsession is with making wines that are, that are really totally unique here. And so we make five different Pinot Noirs, four of them from Michael sites on the property, as well as a little bit of Chardonnay and, and Syrah. And I think you would absolutely love to come visit if you could. Um, and we are very thankful that you're here on today with this little discussion. Fantastic. So I'm going to go in a circle on, in my, um, on my screen. So uh, Megan with Dusky Youth, why don't you uh, talk a little bit about yourself and about Dusky Youth? Great. Thanks, Allison. So uh, my name is Megan Vandette. I'm the National Sales Director at Dusky Youth Winery. Um, we were founded in 2001 and had our first vintage shortly thereafter. Um, John and Linda Carter uh, started Dusky Goose along with our winemaker, Lynn Pennerash. Um, so John and Linda come from Eastern Oregon. They have uh, a long family history of farming in Eastern Oregon and um, had fallen in love with wine from the Dundee Hills AVA. And so they teamed up with Lynn to begin making wine. And uh, our philosophy at Dusky Goose is I think probably a little bit different than a lot of other people in the Willamette Valley. Um, we focus on making Pinot Noir that's really ageable. Um, so we actually reserve a lot of our wine um, and we'll hold it back several years before release. And uh, we make wine with great ageability. Um, something that we're very passionate about here. Um, for a long time, we really only sold our wine through our um, wine club. Um, so a lot of people aren't really all that familiar with Dusky Goose, so we tend to be a, a little bit of a pleasant surprise for a lot of people. Fantastic. Well, we're happy to have you here. Ian, why don't you tell us about Archery Summit? Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me again. I uh, wish I was there with you in person, but this is awesome to kind of be around all these, these wonderful people and colleagues. Um, so Archery Summit. Archery Summit was founded back in 1993 by Gary Andrus, and he had some large visions of how to create something dynamite in the Dundee Hills. So he uh, acquired the land, uh, kicked off a bunch of people that were living in trailers, and decided to build a faux chateau with a quarter of a mile of caves underneath. And I'm lucky winemaker number five uh, over the course of almost 28 years now to come and make wine there. We've got five estate vineyards in the Dundee Hills. We love what the Dundee Hills can do, um, what they have to say. Uh, I think winemaking wise, you know, we're, we're looking for wines with concentration that really show each one of our individual sites. And um, just a little bit about myself. I'm a Cal Poly grad, go Mustangs. Um, I graduated back in 2006 and I worked all over the world, um, the Loire and Burgundy being my favorite, and uh, Oregon's always been calling my name. Uh, Keith Patterson, my college professor, used to always say, you know, if I could redo everything, I would not be in California, I would have established myself in Oregon, and that dream has never left. Um, he passed away, unfortunately, not too long ago, so I uh, credit him for kind of creating this little, this little baby seed in my brain and uh been in Oregon since 2008 and really love the community here and again thanks uh this is great to be here today fantastic so um we'll get to it in a moment but rain dance has the, the name of your auction lot is the mustang so is there like a cal poly connection Ooh. here or is that just happenstance i don't know we'll we'll get to that but that just like hit me as you were like cheering on. I can use so. Archery Summit's liquor license to buy it. So uh, I don't know. We can, I can talk to my boss. <laughs> yeah, there's a connection there. Um, Anne, uh, why don't you give us a little overview about yourself and about Highland? Uh, my name is Anne Seri. I come from a small French island in the Indian Ocean called Reunion Island. My parents were passionate about Burgundian wine, so I spent all my childhood uh, spending just summers in Burgundy, learning about wine, working in a vineyard, and I decided to go to college when uh, I left high school, just to go to college to study uh, vineyard management first. And then just I did some winemaking. Um, I did my undergrad in Burgundy and then my graduate program in Bordeaux. And uh, after doing a couple of vintages in Burgundy, I came to Oregon 
I wanted to see another Pinot Noir growing region and uh, my friends in Burgundy just recommended me to come to Oregon. That was 2008 and I've never left since. So uh, I love Oregon and just uh, I've been working with Highland Estates Fruit since 2009 and been the winemaker for Highland Estates since 2012. Um, so to talk a little bit about Highland, it's a, one of the oldest vineyards planted in the valley. It was planted in 1971 in the McMillville, McMinnville AVA. Uh, it's a south facing slope between 600 and 800 feet in the uh, foothill of the coast range. So a little bit of a cooler climate. It's uh, 200 acres of vineyard, uh, 200 acres, 100 acres planted in vineyard, mostly Pinot Noir, but we also do some Riesling, some Gewürztraminer, uh, some Chardonnay. And it's an amazing vineyard to work with. Um, I've loved every minute of it so far. It's definitely one of the vineyards where the vineyard has more uh, say than the winemakers. Just every year, just uh, I have just to rain in the vineyard a little bit, but um, I, I hope just people will be able just to enjoy that wine. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Megan from Rain Dance, why don't you tell us about Rain Dance and, um, and about you? Yeah, thanks, Allison. And it's uh, great to be part of this group and participating in auction uh, again this year. This is, I believe, Rain Dance's third time participating in this wonderful event. And um, we're really glad they were able, the um, association was able to transition this to this online format and um, benefit a wonderful organization in James Beard. So um, thanks all for participating. And um, I'm a sales, uh, manage wholesale for Rain Dance, and I started with, uh, with uh, Rain Dance in 2016, which was the inaugural release of uh, the first vintage of Rain Dance Wines. Um, it is owned, it's a wonderful property of um, more than 75 acres of vine, all Shehala Mountains ABA, and it is owned by a wonderful family, uh, Ken and Celia Austin, who are uh, multi-generational Newburg, Newburg, Burgundian, if you want to say it that way, uh, Newburg, from Newburgh, um, and they've lived in the Chehalin Mountain um, region for, for years and had, um, had property that was undeveloped um, uh, and were looking as, uh, a, towards a way to really preserve land. And as the wine industry started flourishing in this region, um, they started doing their research and looking into what type of soils they were sitting on. And sure enough, um, with high elevation site, they had some Jory soil and established the first vineyard in 2009. Uh, so 2015 was the inaugural vintage for Rain Dance. And um, it's actually from that inaugural site now. We have four different vineyard sites all together. Again, all Shehala Mountains AVA. Um, but it's from this original uh, inaugural vineyard site that our auction um, blend is from. And it's a beautiful Pomard um, barrel that um, we're really excited to, um, to see go again towards this, this great organization and, and event. And we're excited to be here. Fantastic. And the llamas. you got to mention the llamas. Like you've got <laughs> the, all the llamas of Yamhill County. Yeah, well, I always say the llamas came first. So um, llamas came before vines, that is. The Ken and Sawyer, a long time. The, I didn't know a thing about a llama before I started working with Ken and Celia, but if you wanted to ask me a llama question, I could probably answer the most random question, which is not something I ever expected. But they actually are one of the most prominent um, llama ranchers um, in Oregon and Rain Dance Ranch llamas. They have at any given time, anywhere from 130 to 150 llamas on the ranch um, that they they breed for showing and um, shows all, acro all across the country and um, they sell all across the country. They've actually even sold outside the country. So it's it's actually um, a little side project that's pretty big. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we can talk about the llamas when we get to soil health and fertilization and, and <laughs> maybe you can share more on that. Um, so, and you referenced, Megan, it's great time because you referenced your auction lot, which is great because um, I'd love to have you all share a little bit about the auction lot. How did you pick this? Um, you know, how did you craft this? What's it called and where, what's the site? Um, how did you craft it? And uh, just talk about um, 
yeah, your, your beautiful auction lots. And we're going to go in reverse order because I'm totally going to mix it up. Got to keep it fresh. So Megan, back to you. Talk yeah. about the Mustang. The Mustang. Yeah. So um, actually, this was not a hard decision for, for us to describe our wine as the Mustang. We wanted to find a way to, um, to describe the powerful notes uh, that come from this high elevation um, site. The actual, the name of the vineyard um, that we source from for this uh, barrel is uh, Eagle's Watch Vineyard. And um, again, the inaugural site. And uh, Ken and Celia are quite extensive. Uh, this sounds funny but to say quite extensive, but they're car collectors. Um, and they have quite an extensive car collection. Um, and the very first car that uh, Ken and Celia acquired when they began collecting was the 1964 and a half, I believe, is the technical correct year to, um, to, to describe Mustang. And um, so it was kind of in discussing how we should go about describing our wine, um, the way Ken was describing what that Mustang was, what it meant kind of in America at the time that the car was um, premiered, at the time the Mustang premiered here in terms of uh, pow power and um, just uh, being emblematic of the times. We thought that that was a great depiction uh, to describe this barrel. Um, uh, primarily Pomard, we have about 82, it's 82% 82 Pomard um, from our block four um, at Eagle's Watch and then a little bit of uh, Dijon 115. So it's, um, again, just uh, beautiful, both kind of go hand in hand. The powerful notes of a Mustang are em emblematic of what this Pomard, as in particular the Pomard at this site, um, how powerful it shows. So we have a, a Pinot blend that is, um, especially from the vintage 2018, started off nice and fresh and um, is, in your glass tasting nice and fresh now, but will be um, great, have great tannins and um, age really, really well. Fantastic. And can you tell us about your auction lot? Yeah. So the name of the wine is, I think, about all vine. Um, everything we do in Highland is to try to promote just the age of the wine. And I believe it just uh, it brings a lot. So on the vineyard, on the property, we have vines that have been planted from 1971 all the way to 2008. So we do have a younger part of the vineyard. Uh, but every time we try to find something a little bit more special, it tends to come from the older blocks. Uh, so last year, we're looking just for um, something special for the auction. We went barrel to barrel. And again, just I found that just the best blend was coming from three of our old blocks um, of Cory. So the Cory clone is the clone that is not particularly widespread in Oregon, uh, but it's a very delicate um, rose petal, spicy, uh, that is amazing at Highland. And um, every time we try to look for the best wine at Highland, it just has to come from the Cory clone. And it typically comes from these three blocks, so block 01, DO, 3C, and a little bit of block 6, so all planted in the 70s. Um, and and this wine has um, a lot of freshness. The acidity in Highland, because of the higher elevation, tends to be a little higher, but also very delicate tannins. Uh, and that's how we just crafted that wine, just to to show to show what Highland can be, and just having a wine that is enjoyable now, but definitely can age well um, because of just the acidity and just the, the seamless tannins that it has. That is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, the, um, it's pretty special to have the Cory clone, um, and so, and you've got one of the uh, one of the oldest sites um, of those vines. So, Cory clone is named after Charles Cory, so one of the one of the early founders in the Willamette Valley. So fantastic, Ian. Tell us about yours. Oh, you mean uh, this wine right here? Oh, I don't know if you guys can see it. Yeah, you all should our, be drinking it. Window. So I'll pour myself a glass. I mean, it is almost noon. Um, but so it's always, I think it's always difficult for me trying to find, you know, like what to actually come up with this for these, uh, for these auction lots. Like I think for Salud, it's a little bit more customer facing. So I try to do something really generous and something that has a, a loud voice. But for this, for this one here, I guess we're looking for something a little bit more sophisticated. 
uh, something long lasting, something very ageable. And because we've got you know, five, uh, five different vineyards, we've got um, just, just under 100 acres and we've got 85 different blocks. So I looked into Red Hills, uh, Red Hills Vineyard, south facing, deep jewelry soil. Uh, I always say healthy vines, healthy wines. Like the, the site has a lot of exuberance. There's a really nice sort of gimme factor to it. And I think it's something that like the nerdy people that you know geek out on wine love and i think the everyday consumer can really just appreciate there's like this really good uh tasty factor to it um we have our cave system underneath the winery so i thought it was clever to call it cave cubay because um, by having this underground system the wine stay at 55 degrees all year long there's a beautiful humidity so the wine doesn't um, evapotranspirate out of the wood so we don't have to top as much and you know just kind of keeps the wine in a nice sort of steady path. Uh, this in particular cuvee is from the top of the site. I'm trying to figure out where to draw lines in the vineyard um, just in terms of quality and difference and this will be my third harvest at Archery Summit and I'm still figuring out what areas I like the most but the top three blocks uh, on the site, they're a mix of Dijon clone. They tended to have the most character. So we put a few barrels together to kind of come up with this blend. Um, and I think we're, we're really happy with it. And for any of you lucky people out there that called in and got a sample, I hope you're enjoying it. Um, we did uh, about 30% whole cluster here. I always tend to be around 30% new oak um, because I, if I spend a lot more money, the wine becomes a lot more expensive. Um, and I think it's also conducive to our style. Um, I think that we like to extract um, enough to where the wine has concentration, but we're also looking for quite a bit of that finesse. And I don't rely on a, an incredible amount of oak tannin. So in this wine, I feel like it's just, just slightly perceptible. Um, my wife always says it's funny when you watch a cooking show, you can watch them prepare and then taste. I always feel like it's weird when I'm tasting um, uh, and talking about it, but I think we have to because we're Zooming. But I, I do feel like the wine's very spicy and uh, subtle. And I, uh, I hope that whoever the lucky winner of this auction lot is enjoys it. No doubt, I'm sure they will. So I'm glad that you are drinking your wine. I see Anne's got some wine. I believe you all have some wine, which is fantastic. And for those of you watching, are you also drinking wine? And if so, what's in your glass? So share that with us while, we, while Megan talks about the Dusky Goose auction lot. Thanks, Allison. So our wine is called the Golden Goose, um, kind of a, a, an obvious name, um, but we only make the Golden Goose specifically for this auction. And so each year we try to come up with um, a unique blend of um, grapes that's something a little bit different than we do um, in any of our other cuvées. So um, what we're trying to do with the Golden Goose is really um, showcase the aging potential of Pinot Noir from Willamette Valley. Um, so what we're doing to make it is we're identifying specific blocks within each of the three vineyard sites that um, went into this wine, um, looking for uh, elegance and structure. Um, so we're sourcing fruit from our Fenwood Vineyard in Yamal Carlton. That's primarily clone 777. We get a lot of aromatics from it. Um, and it's, it's really interesting, you know, in this wine, it's, um, it's coming across more like, like black pepper and cardamom and like dried blueberries and um, more so than um, that bright expressive fruit that you would think initially would come out of the glass. It's sort of a, a layered aromatics. Um, we have about 20% um, from our estate Rambouillet Vineyard, that's a uh, Pomard clone, and that's where we're getting a lot of the elegance from. Um, also, the ageability, of course, as well. And then there's a very small amount from Lily's Vineyard, which is right next door to the Rambouillet Vineyard. It's a little bit of Dijon 115, um, and that's where we're getting our structure from. So um, Lynn is a big fan of using uh, different oak treatments in our wines. So she uses a combination of new French oak, one year used, two year years, and then completely neutral oak. Um, and again, we think that adds to the nuances of flavor. 
Um, so with this wine, you know, we talked about uh, the aging potential, and that's a theme for Dusky Goose just across the board. Um, this 2018, I think easily we could age it a decade, possibly longer if you're storing it in the right conditions. Um, personally, I've had some Dusky Goose wines from back in 2003, and to say that the wines just held up is not doing justice to the juice in the bottle. Um, so it's definitely, if you have the patience, um, that's the key, because not all of us do, but if you have the patience to lay the bottles down for a while, I think it's, it's definitely worth the wait. Fantastic. So Robert, tell us about Purple Diamond. I love the concept. I'd like Purple Diamond. Except you're on mute though. We can't, we can't read your lips. Oh, I got muted. There we go. Can you hear me now, Allison? We good? Okay, thank you guys. We're good. Yeah, so, so Purple Diamond. So this is our Cygnus block. So it's a little bit, I, I approach my, this auction lot every year a little bit differently. I am a big believer in this concept of intent when it comes to winemaking. So this wine actually started um, before the grapes were picked, uh, made a decision about how we were gonna make this wine for the auction this year and from which part, unique part of the vineyards uh, that we were gonna work with this year for the, for the auction lot. So this comes from our Cygnus block. Our Cygnus block is a planting of the uh, Swan selection directly out of the Joe Swan vineyard in, in uh, Sonoma. This is one of the oldest selections of Pinot Noir. Um, in, in California, and I'm a big believer in these, these older heritage selections, as I call them. Um, so this is one selection, and it's on a very, I know it's on an eastern slope. So part of the, the vineyard, um, uh, part of the estate here is that, the reason why I ended up with this piece of property is in addition to different soils, different geological expression, we also have different aspects. And this is an east-facing slope. It's the only east-facing slope that I have point, planted at this point. And it is, a, it is a small hill that is the result of up, some uplifted intrusion, young basalts, under which there are all these old, old marine basalts. These marine basalts are completely infused with, with salt crystals, basically. These are, these are crystals that have that have condensed out of the water and are mixed in the rock. So I like to see, think of this particular part of the vineyard as being a, a collection of diamonds. So it is the diamonds that are the crystals uh, from the ancient sea, seas. And then this is the block that um, Ellen elected to plant in place of an engagement ring. So when we decided that we were gonna get married, or at least I decided that, um, we decided that rather than put the money into a single rock, that we would instead, uh, Ellen's choice, um, that we would plant this one unique part of the, of the site, of the vineyard. Um, and so this is the Cygnus block, the Swan block. Um, and within the block, there is a sub block, a sub part of the vineyard that this wine was specifically chosen from. Um, about a half a ton of grapes picked by hand, of course, hand loaded into a puncheon. So this is a double barrel, take the lid off. Um, we fill the barrel with the grapes. Um, about, um, probably about 60 or 70% whole cluster with a little bit of distemmed fruit on top. The, 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 bar the, the puncheons are always lightly foot treaded as we load them and then they are punched down by hand during the course of the fermentation. So fermented in punchin, and then when we press off, we go to uh, a once used uh, a single barrel. And from that single barrel, we, we then uh, bottle the five cases of this lot. So it's, it's really, it's an expression of Cygnus, but it is completely different from Cygnus. And, and it has way more depth and concentration to it. I love, I love the, the length of fruit component and structure. I'm a big structure winemaker. And I love the way the, the swan selection structures the mouth on Pinot Noir. And on our site here, we are actually right below Highland Vineyards, you know, so in the coast range there in McMinnville AVA, a wine where we get 
uh, a place where we get very savory wines. These, I like to say that's the expression of the minerals in the ground that are driving the way the vines develop. Um, and this wine there has a lot of intensity, a lot of savoriness to it. And like all of my wines, um, has the potential, uh, I think, of aging 20, 25 years. These, these are really, an, this is a really intense, beautiful wine and a very different expression uh, than anything else I've ever made. I quite love this lot. So cheers, and I hope all of, I wish all of you had a chance to try it. Um, and that even includes you, Ian, I don't know why, but I'd love that. Uh, I, Robert, and, I've got and, some and of your you bottles. Know, the cool thing about, and you know, the cool thing about, about, about Highland, and I really love Highland Vineyards, is it's one of the main reasons that I ended up buying this piece of property. Because I think the wines that come off of this slope um, it, and this, this little piece of the Willamette Valley really do make very unique wines. And I think that's very true in your selection, um, the wines coming off of Highland and off of, uh, and off of my site here. So, Purple Diamonds. Cheers. Fantastic. So Robert, there were a couple of questions specifically about your auction lot. Um, if you could quickly touch on them. Why do you like the Swan Vineyard so much? And then can you explain the difference between fermenting and aging in a puncheon? Oh, okay. Well, those are, those are topics that I could uh, talk about way too long. Let me, let me throw but out. But you won't. You just get a short amount. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the puncheon really quick, because I think it's very, it's very significant here. And that is um, that when you ferment in small wood uh, vessels, you, you extract the characteristics of the wood early and you get a softness and a roundness um, and a, a very much more complex integration of wood. Uh, and, and then the whole dynamics of extraction is very different. So you get a very different structured wine that has a lot of different um, mouthfeel components to it. So that's and as opposed to just simply aging in puncheon, where what you're really trying to do there is perhaps give the wine the influence of the wood, but at a less concentration of wood because you, you have a larger volume. So two very different, different approaches. And I think I've talked about the Swan selection. It, it, it really is unique and particularly in the length of the forward part and the structure um, of the wine itself. So. There you go. Great. Nicely done. So now I th would love to hear your thoughts on the 2018 vintage. And, you know, is this the vintage of the decade? Maybe. Is this the vintage of the century? Like how, just how good is this vintage? And then also, if you can add some color to the vintage, um, what were some of the biggest challenges? What were some of the coolest things that happened? Um, you know, what was the best meal you had during harvest, if you can remember that? Uh, did all your interns show up? How much equipment broke down? You know, those are the stories that actually are kind of, in my mind, a little more interesting about harvest, because that's what you tend to remember. And then you're like, oh, yeah, what was the weather like? But yes, sh share your thoughts about the 2018 vintage. Um, Anne, let's start with you. On the spot. Um, the one thing I remember about 18 was it was a very easy vintage. Um, every year, I mean, 17 was good, but every year we have a little bit of challenges as far as just, are we picking too early? Do we need to wait a little bit? The weather is not that great. Uh, we don't have enough interns or they don't show up on time. And 18, everything went just seamlessly. Um, it was the one vintage I remember at the end of it, talking to Laurent and just saying, this vintage was just so easy. I wish everyone would be like that. And I'm hoping 19 will be the same. And of course it was not. But uh, that's what I remember about 18. Um, it was the condition were perfect, uh, not too hot, not too cold, not too early, not too late. We didn't have to do anything to the grapes. Highland was just showing great. Just, it's an old vineyard, all self-rooted. Uh, we're biodynamic, so some years just the disease pressure is a little higher, but 18 didn't have that. Um, and we didn't have really to do much, just the wine just came out, I can't say perfectly, but in my opinion, almost perfectly. Uh, and our crew was one of the best crew we had during harvest. So um, it was just the perfect storm, but in a good way. Everything right happened at the same time. Anybody can jump in and talk. 
about the about the 2018 vintage. I Jump love away. this vintage. Yeah, 2018 for me. I always remember we're bottling our 17s. Um, I had I had inherited a cellar of barrels full of wines, so I put the wines together with my very talented crew, who I would be nothing without. Those guys and gals are amazing. But we started bottling, and we had no we had no rain for over 100 days. And the day we bottled, it started pouring rain. Um, but it's also good too because our and all just ran up to me uh, just before that. I was like, "Oh my God, our bricks are like are really starting to climb." So um, the rain allowed everything to kind of slow down, it allowed us to finish bottling. And I agree with Anne. I think it was just smooth sailing. Nothing broke. Um, you know, there's just a lot of intensity. The 18s are really, I like wines that have like this sort of, um, let's say concentration and I like color. I like wines that have a lot to say, especially at the beginning of their life. I always feel like, you know, there's this subtractive sort of evolution that wines go through. They start out really loud and or loudly and then they slowly sort of just, they start to kind of not fall apart, but they, they start to kind of follow a, a different different path. And I always like a lot to start with. And uh, I think 2018, just in terms of tannin, uh, color, uh, flavor, just have so much to give. And just fun watching people open them up and smell them and taste them because I feel like it's uh, kind of a showier vintage for, for Oregon. I, I loved it. Very, very nice year for us at Archery Summit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to echo. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead, Megan. I was going to say to echo um, what Ann and Ian both said um, when I asked Brian, our winemaker, our wines are produced at Alexana Winery in the Dundee Hills, and he had um, very similar things to, to say about 2018, an ideal, an ideal vintage um, coming off again, as I mentioned, it's a high elevation site, so um, moderate alcohol, good acidity, and um, really everything went off without a hitch and um, no real hiccups to to discuss or speak of. I can say um, <laughs> since uh, Brian um, it is, but he's my husband. So he was home a lot earlier for dinner that year. I remember during harvest, um, which was nice. So also too, I think the 2018 um, is uh, going to be again, one that ages really, really, really well, really great structure in the wines. Yeah, I was going to say that it was before my time with Dusky Goose, but what I'm told by uh, Lynn and our vineyard manager, Andy, is uh, that they were most excited about how little rain there was in September, October, so they weren't constantly dodging the rain left and right during harvest. Robert, you've had a lot of vintages under your belt. How does this, how does 2018 compare? So uh, I was just trying to, I was just trying to add up in my mind, I I think this was vintage 45, number 45 for me. Um, I may be wrong on that, uh, but I know it's in there. Some, it's, in, it's somewhere in the mid 40s. Uh, um, and I, I think that, that uh, it's funny, you would, I sometimes forget the names of my two children, um, but I rarely actually forget vintages. And vintages are for me, uh, personalities. They, they, they really offer a wine a personality. So in some winemaking, uh, in some cellars, winemaking, the techniques that you use can really shape a wine to the point that vintage disappears. And I think what's really important about what's going on in the Northern Willamette Valley, and specifically the wines that are made for this auction, and certainly with all of the people we have on today, the wines these, these, the winemakers here really allow that personality of the vintage to come through in their wines. And I think it's, it's really important um, that if you're a serious wine consumer of, of Willamette Valley Pinot Noirs, that you really do get this view of vintage every year. And so I agree that the 18 vintage was an easy vintage in that we didn't have a lot of of um, disease pressure, there was certainly some out there. Um, there was not a lot of rain events, but but it was a warm vintage, and the wines are rich and and quite quite um, 
they develop, they've developed pretty early. Uh, they're showing themselves well. I think it's kind of a showy vintage um, and, and, and a vintage that uh, you wouldn't be remiss to uh, show to your California Pinot friends uh, because it has, that, it has that richness, but it's still a very elegant Oregon vintage. So nice acidity, uh, nice, uh, really nice structure in the wines, but in that little more opulent, little more seductive uh, character as a vintage. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I am super excited about the 2018 vintage, and which only heightens my disappointment that I don't get to actually attend the auction in person and go around and taste everybody's wines, because that is always a highlight for me. And part, of, you know, I feel like I'm losing out on my education not getting to walk around and try everyone's 2018s. But it is definitely um, a very, very special, special vintage. So. One thing that I wanted to open up and, and talk about and just get everyone's thoughts on is the influence of the site versus the influence of the winemaker. And you all are coming from different sites, um, two from McMinnville, one Shahala Mountains, two um, uh, Dundee Hills, uh, and then Dusky Goose has a little bit of Young Hill Carlton fruit in there as well. So you, you've got a good array of, of sites and soils that are represented in, in your wines. Um, so when, when you're approaching making a wine, how much of the end result is influenced from the site versus what you're doing the, in the winemaker's hand? So just kind of opening that up for anybody who wants to, who wants to talk about that. Well, I'll, I'll just jump in really quick because I feel like I've already kind of addressed this, but I do, I, I would say that in my case, uh, I think that site expression is sort of the ultimate challenge to a winemaker. I think you, you really have to be at the top of your game um, to allow, to, to sort of put aside all the beautiful little techniques that you can do in the cellar that make a wine uh, a certain way. And, and so it was, a, it was an intention when I purchased the vineyard that I did that the wines really be reflective of the site every year. So the vintage differences are there, but the site is there. So I think in my case, the wines are the most uniquely driven by uh, the differences within the site. And that's especially true with our auction lot. So like our auction lot, and unfortunately I haven't had a chance to taste Anne's, but I would guess with Highland the same thing, those two wines could only come from the McMinnville AVA. And they have the intensity, the concentration, they have the savory components that are really absolutely from this, this one unique part of the world. And um, in, in, in the case of Britain wine, um, it is actually even more specific to the one spot uh, in the vineyard itself. So for us, that's what really drives our winemaking. Yeah, and, and I'll jump to that just, um, when I make wine, the idea is just to be able to go around the cellar and taste the wines blind and be able to recognize the block by tasting blind. And that for me means that the vineyard is showing and I'm not just showing. I'm just there, just, I'm trying to be there to be the transition between grapes and the final product because by itself, wine will make by itself. We still need just a little bit of intervention. But just to do it so we can recognize easily what's our Dijon, what's our Cory, what's our the old block, the newer block. Just when I had just a guest the other day just coming to taste some Chardonnay and I said, oh, do you mind tasting our, our 19 just to give me your opinion? And he was like, oh, that smells like Highland. And that was the best compliment I could get. It's just because it smelled like the vineyard. And that's exactly, I guess, how we approach making wine. I want just uh, every any wine that I'm making just to be tasting like the vineyard, like the clone, like the part of the vineyard itself, it's such a big vineyard that there's, there's different characteristics based on whether you're on the north part or the south part. And um, so that being said, of course, just there is, there is some intervention to be made. Um, I do destem almost 100%. I'm not a big fan of whole cluster, typically, at least not on the highland side. I just find it just to be on the slightly green side for certain years. Uh, but beyond that, it's just, I, I think it's very important just to be able to, to recognize the site, especially with such a unique site. I think it's a fun question. Um, I always think of Jasper Morris, 
he wrote a book called Inside Burgundy, and he always talks about the hand of the winemaker. And you know, something that he uh, he wrote years ago, it's always stuck in my brain, is like the hand of the winemaker. I feel like tends to attract people in the young life of the wine. You know, if you um, pick your fruit right, and I feel like there's like a lot of acid to give it life. Um, the alcohol is not impeding things. Um, you don't overdress it with oak or over extract it in the fermenter. Um, I feel like, you know, it's, it, it kind of goes down to style with Anne um, destemming most of her fruit. We add a little bit of whole cluster because I feel like if you add it and extract it a certain way, it has a way of drawing people in. And it's almost like a, a dash of like cologne or perfume that I feel like brings people to like be interested in your wine. But I feel like if you make the wine well, those nuances that I feel like are really loud in the, the young life of the wine tend to kind of fade away. And I think if the wine's well made, you can really see the site. You could see exactly where that, that wine came from. Um, and I mean, Robert, gosh, like 45 vintages. I think I've had, I'm like, I think this will be my 20th. And I think it's the hardest thing ever to figure out you know, what consistently a block will give you, um, you know, like, do we take more leaves off to allow more sun on the fruit? You know, do we hang more fruit or less fruit? You know, and I think mother nature is always serving you up, um, you know, and a, a fast pitch or a, a softball. And there's just so many things to kind of be mindful of. But I feel like the more you do this, the more you uh, play with wine and get into your vineyard and I was just listening to Robert talk about you know the difference for 20 feet from you know an, another little like micro area in his site uh, that's truly understanding what you have but to not babble any further I just I feel like the winemakers can like can do their little things but I, I feel like don't don't go too far because I feel like your imprint will live with that one forever and I feel like if you do it right, your imprint fades away, and then the site has something to say for a very long time. That's my philosophy. Yeah, it's, um, I think, kind of in line with what everybody else has said. Um, you know, it's an interesting question, really. You know, the end result, the finished bottle of wine doesn't exist one without the other, right? The land, you know, land or the hand. But maybe one way um, Brian would potentially describe it would be maximum land, minimal hand, and um, really, you know, working with the site and letting it show its expression, expression and, and um, each site is different, and pulling from this particular site for this barrel, um, as mentioned, it's the high elevation site, so it's a little bit more delicate, and um, actually probably one of the more fortunate things is it's a later site um, because of its high elevation and so um, pulling the fruit in a little little later and um, just you know like I said minimal hand once it's in barrel um, I think turns out everything turns out wonderfully in the end and they don't exist without the other so maximum hand maximum land minimal hand I like, like it <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's an analogy that I use for this um, fairly often is um, it's sort of that nature versus nurture, right? Um, and to me, that makes me think about raising children. Um, so your children are going to be born probably with a, a, their, their personality traits, right? They're just basic um, who they are as a human, but then um, the way their parents raise them will determine exactly how those traits present. Um, so I sort of use in talking about this because I think that um, site specific wine is it's incredibly important um, because that's going to form your foundation and the overall personality of the wine um, but then it's the winemaker's job to you know tease out uh, different aspects of that personality to shape um, whatever their vision is for that wine whether it be to stay as close to um, the original product that they get as they possibly can or if there's certain um, elements that they they want to highlight that's a great analogy. Um, Allison? So Robert? Yeah, so, so Ian, I, I, I need to follow up on this cologne, this whole cluster cologne thing. Is, yeah. is, what you're saying is that you rub whole cluster grapes on your face 
before you go home during harvest? It's more complicated. In the door, is that what you just said? I have like this little dome on top of the fermenter and it goes into this little spike and then it drips into a bowl and then I heat that up and then I concentrate it and then I dab it on my neck when I get home and give my wife a big kiss. You know, that's that's the thing. That's the thing. (laughs) All right. That takes it to a whole nother level. Um, And we've got a question. Somebody wants to know what is the retail price and where can we buy this whole cluster cologne what's it called also oh man i'm gonna have to work with robert on this i just usually give people oh, yeah. I'm like done. A, I'm done. a jar with a little spray bottle yeah i mean i uh, i think it's funny actually i think uh I, I don't know if you guys ever heard of on florage but you can get like flowers you put them in lard and then you put it in a glass container um and you keep kind of adding flowers to this mixture you pull them out after a few days and you can actually render scents from this solution it's an old uh way of making cologne back in um in in france but i always think about like all the things that whole cluster can give to wine just in terms of like nuances like sandalwood um cardamom like allspice there's just these little these little nuances that you can you can get from whole cluster extraction that i i adore And we keep it on the top of the fermenter. So um, by pumping over initially, you get a little bit of that green note. But then when we start punching that whole cluster into the wine, it's usually about halfway through the ferment. And by then, all the whole clusters go from green to brown. So you get more of those brown spices getting into the wine. So I I don't like to play a lot with uh, the green. um, And I feel like I'm more in the the brown spectrum when it comes to whole cluster. It's, forget it's it forget it man with. forget it i'm just i this is all that's all bullshit you you're the the thing that's going to stick with me in this whole zoom call is you rubbing whole clusters on your face in order to get in the door at night that's I what think, i'm i think you're going to be getting some late night texts this uh, harvest robert <laughs> <laughs> watch out <laughs> for sure i am not even sure where to take this So I'm going to take this in a whole nother direction. We have a question from somebody wondering about the 2020 vintage. So how is it looking? What are you seeing out there in the vineyards? What are you getting ready for from a winemaking perspective? It's a great question. No grapes. There's no grapes out there, guys. Low crops. There's no grapes out there. Yeah, we're we're gonna take thing called COVID. <laughs> we're gonna take the we're gonna take the harvest off. It's hard to determine. I mean, we're we're about to get our crop estimates, so we'll have those real well, soon here. But prepare, your, prepare yourself because uh, they're really uh, it's so it's a very low crop year. You know, we had quite a bit of rain. We've had a very it's a very unusual year. So a person who loves vintages, I think this is going to be pretty exciting. Except that. There's not a lot of grapes out there in the vineyard. So because of the rain we had during, during bloom, uh, we had a lot of shatter. We've had a lot of restriction, a lot of reduced uh, berry size, and more importantly, just no berries on a lot of clusters. So we really are looking at, at very low yields in a lot of vineyards, which you're right, Ian, that does make the winemaking a little bit easier because it makes the logistics and the winery easier, but it also, uh, puts even more pressure on every decision you make because we all get our raw product only once a year. And when you have a very small amount of it, um, you don't, you're not willing to take chances. And it's the chances from which I think you learn. Uh, so uh, in that sense, I think the 2020 vintage is going to be very, um, a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a, um, a stressful vintage. Um, we've also had very low total uh, energy inputs into our vineyard. So a lot of overcast, a lot of clouds this year. Um, and we've had fairly cool temperatures. So all the things that make this, I think, an ideal, fascinating, gonna be a hell of a vintage, um, are also the ones that are gonna make everybody on this little Zoom call a, a little more nervous right now than they want to admit. Right. I'll say our yields are going to be definitely low and we have a lot of shattered highland, but I'm pretty excited to see that many hens and chicks 
So all these small berries, I think, just gonna make a lot of concentration. And I might just this year actually, if we get to the the good ripeness, just to do a little bit more whole cluster, just to try mm. to hang on to that and keep these little berries whole, and just to extract just slowly. And um, I'll try to see in the the bright side of things. And it just just walking through the vineyard, it's almost everywhere, and mm -hmm. it, it's gonna make it for something a little different for sure. I was going to ask you that, Anne, just because, you know, we've, we've had a lot of success when you get like these little, like tiny clusters, tiny berries, mm -hmm. you know, instead of throwing them through the distemmer and mashing them up, um, sometimes it's nice to, you know, place them right, right there straight into the ferment. I feel like you can get, um, you know, a lot of beautiful extraction. And because the berries are so small, I feel like there is going to be a great amount of like fruit concentration this year. But I'm just wondering, um, I'm, I'm thinking the, the fruit's gonna come off like a lot more quickly. We're seeing, gosh, on a lot of our clusters, 80% chicks, 20% hens. Um, so I'm, I'm anticipating maybe more of a rapid, a rapid harvest, like things are gonna get ripe and things are gonna start moving. But um, yeah, I, I'm excited about 2020. I think this is gonna be, it's gonna be a very um, tasty vintage, I think. So I think it might be helpful just to explain hens and chicks to folks in case not everybody understands what that what that means. And do you want to? Um, sure. Um, sure. Well, during bloom, just typically, it's just the the flower will transform into a full berries with seed in it. Uh, if if the weather is not ideal, the flower will be somewhat aborted, and the berry will grow without a seed. Uh, a seed, sorry. <laughs> accent sometimes. Uh, so it's very, very tiny uh, berries that we call chicks and the hens are just the bigger berries. So on one clusters you have regular sized berries and tiny, tiny berries without a seed. So the, the concentration is there because the, the, the skin versus the amount of juice in that berry is a lot higher than just on a regular berry. So a lot of time you have a lot more color, a lot more um, ar aromas. It just, it makes it for a very interesting wine typically. Well, and it sounds like this is going to be the year that Ian can really launch his whole cluster um, cologne business as well, because there's oh. a lot of opportunity for whole cluster pressing. 100%. For cluster fermentation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just so wait. I think... I think we have time for one last question. Um, and there was a really interesting question that was just posed um, around mechanical harvesting. And, you know, normally I would ask, hey, you know, who works with mechanical harvesting? Are you, are you doing that? Are you handpicking? But the question was actually more in the vein of, is that something that you're now looking at doing because of COVID and social distancing? Um, and then I would layer on top of that, you know, just the challenge of getting, um, getting pickers, of getting labor. So I, I don't know who wants to start with that. Um, and share your thoughts. I'll answer quickly because we've been doing some mechanical harvest in our vineyard for a while on the younger part and we're not planning on doing any more. Um, it looks like we will be able, so we have a fairly decent sized crew, so we think just we'll be able just to pick, um, probably picking a lot slower. So we're not too worried about the picking part, it's mostly in the winery. We have just to think just logistically of how to keep our distances, so we're going to we won't be able to pick as much in a day or to receive as many fruit in a day because we won't have as many people in the winery itself. So uh, that's going to slow down things in a vineyard a little bit. And because of that hens and chicks issue, I don't think mechanical harvesting will just be ideal either. We won't be able just to get all these berries of the, of the stem. So uh, yeah, for quality reason and for logistic, we're not planning on just increasing the quantity at all. It's just going to remain on the younger part of the vineyard and that's it. Yeah, we are, um, we hand harvest everything. We don't have any plans to change any of that. Um, but I have noticed our, our vineyard crews are definitely uh, spaced a little bit further apart than they normally would be, understandably so. Robert, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you. It's going to be a, it's going to be a, I, I think it's going to be because of COVID, a very, very difficult harvest. Um, unfortunately, our, our vineyard crews um, really have borne the brunt of the virus. So we see, we're seeing a lot uh, higher concentration of people that have come become ill um, in our labor crews. Um, so getting, I'm concerned that uh, 
that we're, there are going to be fewer people to pick. Um, majority of the vineyards in the Willamette are har hand harvested. We are uh, completely hand harvested and actually having had a lot of experience with machines while in Napa, it would be difficult to, to actually hand harvest this vineyard. Um, and we are going to be completely dependent upon our, our crews to do a good job. Low picking, that means a lot more work to fill a bucket um, of grapes. So it's going to be slow, hard work for harvest. Um, and we are very clearly um, separating um, all, of, all of our team who work in the vineyards um, from our team that works in the winery this year. And we have very, very strict protocols in both places uh, that are going to, as Anne said, that are going to definitely slow down our ability uh, to process fruit um, in a timely way. So in that sense, I, it's probably gonna be, even though it's way more work for our, our labor crews um, picking, it's probably gonna be a good thing for the wineries that we actually have a lower crop. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I can't believe that we've gone through an entire hour. We're actually a minute over. So it's time to wrap up, but thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you for supporting um, all of our amazing Willamette Valley wineries and for supporting our auction. So I hope there's many delicious glasses of Pinot Noir from Oregon in your near future. And thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank nice you. fun hangout. Thank thanks to all our panelists. Big thanks to Allison, our moderator, and thank you so much to all of you. Uh, please join us if you are trade next week. Um, our auction is 11, 12th, and 13th of August next week. I dropped the link to register to bid in the chat if you haven't already done so. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for attending, and we'll see you at the auction. Bye.